Greetings, and welcome back to the Rose Bros Podcast. This episode, we are joined by Mr. Mick Dilger, Chairman of Secure Energy Services and previous CEO of Pemina Pipeline, two energy companies listed on the TSX with a market cap of approximately $2 billion and $23 billion, respectively. Mr. Dilger was the Chief Executive Officer of Pemina Pipeline from January 2014 until November 2021. Prior to that, Mr. Dilger was Pemina's President, COO, and Vice President Business Development from 2005 until 2013. Before joining Pemina, Mr. Dilger worked as a senior executive in various financial and business development positions in both oil and gas as well as infrastructure companies. Mr. Dilger was a director of Trilogy Energy Trust for 14 years where he served as the chairman of the Health, Safety and Environment Committee until 2017 when Trilogy was sold. Mr. Dilger was also the co-chair of the 2016 United Way of Calgary campaign. Mr. Dilger has been a Chartered Professional Accountant since 1989 and holds a Bachelor of Commerce degree from the University of Calgary. Among other things, we sat down and discussed growing a company to a $40 billion market cap, the value of authenticity, and why scarcity is important in business. Enjoy. This podcast episode is sponsored by Conate Water Solutions. Do you need cost-effective water sourcing options to supply your next drilling or completions program? Conate Water Solutions is a specialized hydrogeology company focused on water well drilling, testing, and water management services in Western Canada and Texas. Contact info at conatewater.com or check out conatewater.com for more details. This episode is brought to you by Canada Action, whose aim is to promote the importance of Canada's energy industry, which is the bedrock of our nation's economy, providing hundreds of thousands of jobs and economic opportunities across the country. Learn more at CanadaAction.ca or check out Canada Action on social media. This podcast is sponsored by HeadRacingCanada.com. In partnership with four-time Olympian Manny Osborne Parody, HeadRacingCanada.com is offering European factory performance ski gear from its online storefront by passing brick-and-mortar savings on to customers. Check out HeadRacingCanada.com for more info on the 2024 collection and get your high-performance ski gear for the upcoming season. Good morning, Mr. McDilger. Thank you very much for doing this. It's all pleasure is all mine. I really appreciate your time. I know it is valuable, but there are a lot of listeners out there that will appreciate this conversation. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. This conversation is also a lesson in perseverance. I learned a lot of things from the podcast, but I first reached out to you, I think it was in April. So six months later, here we are. <laughs> Another lesson to take from all this. Absolutely. Nowadays, you are the chairman of Secure Energy Services, among other things. You're an entrepreneur, but for the listener, how would you describe yourself nowadays? Well, I, I, I think I've always been an entrepreneur, absent the 15 years I run Pembina. I would say these days I am returning to my roots. I love creating something where nothing existed before. Getting back in touch with uh, the humility of, of all that and, and reconnecting with a lot of people when you have a job like I had. There's uh, work, there's fitness, and then there's family, and a lot of other things fall by the wayside. So trying to smell the roses, take a few vacations, get back into activities, reconnect with people, and plan you know what I'm going to be up to for the next 15 years. A lot of people might not know that you also had an entrepreneurial career before Pemina, which I learned today. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I would say that even Pemina was an entrepreneurial career when you think back mm -hmm. when, when uh, you know, it was a great company when I had the pleasure of joining. And I think the enterprise value is about $2 billion. And we grew that to 20 times the size together with some great people. And it was very entrepreneurial. You think about where that started it as just a, a pipeline and gathering pipeline business. And then it became a you know, behemoth vertically integrated energy infrastructure company. But yes, prior to that, I've been multi-sector um, and I'm in currently, as you mentioned, secure, but also I'm the chair of a small solar company developing intellectual property. Been in medical, I've been in 
uh, upstream, midstream, uh, lots of different uh, sectors and variety and learning is a spice of life. And let's try what I'm trying to do now, go kind of get more into the upstream side, which I, I didn't know as well. Mm-hmm. And I would characterize my last two years as about learning. To rewind a little bit, if I'm correct, you're an accountant by training, got your degree at the UFC. Correct. How'd you get into energy? Well, I think in Calgary, it's kind of in the background where people think they're going to end up. My father and brothers were our engineers, all of them. So that's where I started in, in two years of engineering and then transferred into to commerce. And when I graduated, there weren't many jobs. Um, I majored in accounting and took a job at what was then called Clarkson Gordon and now Ernst & Young and learned a ton there. And and from there, I got recruited uh, by Amarada Hess, which ironically just got sold the other day to right. to Chevron and spent a bunch of years there and and just kind of meandered through the, the patch doing upstream and midstream. And then midstream kind of was where my interest was for, for two decades. Was it the Haskane School of Business at the time? It was Haskane, yeah. I also went there. So. Oh, no kidding. <laughs> Small world. Yeah, it was a it was a great school. I I think I went there around the time Scurfield Hall opened. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it was a long time. And as we sit here and with Matt go here and Ron Matheson's offices, I'm reminded he made such a generous donation up there recently, and he's a difference maker. I uh, went to look at the Matheson Hall a few months ago, and uh, it was after the Mike Tim's episode, and so it was his name on a lecture hall. So <laughs> yeah, it was a uh, pretty cool. It's really cool. Incredible donation from both of those guys. Yeah, both self-made men and still working hard. You know, I, I see Tim Z in here every day, like he's trying to get on steady still. You know, he just loves loves commerce. Both of those guys do. <clears throat> Lots of accounts start out in the business, but not many make it to the top, so to speak. The CEO of a multi-billion dollar company. From your perspective, why do you think you ended up where you did? What led you down that path? I would say I have some entrepreneurial exposure through my dad. Like he was a professor of civil engineering at the UFC, but he was always inventing stuff. He's got a bunch of patents. And so there was always that desire. I think a lot of it was just a thirst for knowledge and hard work. I would say I'm a solid B student. I didn't get honors. I didn't, but I, I was creative. I think I understood people. I was ambitious. Mm-hmm. And I had a, a curiosity, thirst for knowledge that just compelled me and liked to create things and understand things. When you took over the company, if I'm correct, the market cap was around $2 billion. When you left, it was $30, $40 billion? Yeah, that's that's almost right. When I joined the company, it was $2 billion. By the time I was CEO, I think we were closer to nine. But uh, I wasn't charged with business development from the time I joined. And I was very lucky to work with one of my mentors, Bob Bignaleski, who really taught me the, I was kind of a more like a private equity guy. Like that was my mindset when I joined there. And he taught me the, the value of a family-based company and winning the hearts and minds of all the employees. And that's something that I thank him for and continue to, it's part of my, who I am now. And, uh, yeah, we grew that company and a lot of companies you join and if you have a what you think is a good idea, it's threatening to people. And in that company, it was the opposite. It was like, good idea. How can we help? So the whole company was engaging and, and supportive and well, the rest is history. We were a great team together. What do you think led to that growth? Was it good capital allocation? Be good to the employees, people like working for you, a bit of luck? What do you think it was? Well, I, I think Pamina was an early adopter to recognizing that for a business to be successful, all the stakeholders have to be successful. So yes, <laughs> you know, you have to bring people, you know, with you, you have to inspire people. Uh, they're obviously a key stakeholder. You have to get along with communities, especially in a linear pipeline business when you've got 10,000 kilometers of pipe, you only need a kilometer not to work. And it doesn't, doesn't work out. And, um, you need customers to think they're getting a fair deal. 
most importantly, and I think it's, it's lost a little bit these days is you've got to make money. You've got to be able to pay your employees well and treat communities right and get after, you know, your sins. If you have any environmental liabilities, take care of the environment, but none of that's possible if you're not making money. And I think, uh, the capital markets are refocusing a little bit now on making money and not as much, uh, I think the pendulum swung a little too far on what I call virtue signaling and looking good rather than being good. And, and I see that pendulum swinging back. It's never going to swing back to cutthroat, don't take care of stakeholders, not, not at all. But I think it's finding a, a good balance of stakeholder engagement, management and, and profitability. Some people rise to the ranks sitting in meetings or giving PowerPoints, but when they become CEO, they're not very good and they don't last long. You lasted for quite some time and you also grew the company in a meaningful way. Were you aware of that difference when you took over and were you worried about actually creating value? Did you think of it that way rather than just taking over and treading water? I would say the thing I'm proudest of is I was, I was myself the whole time, like right to the time that I, I left and I was a construction worker at, at a time. And so I know what it's like to try to build a house when it's minus 20 and windy. I always say good executives also speak field like another language. You know, they have to know what it's like and that everything works on a spreadsheet doesn't always work on the, in the field. And so I think the, the way I am resonated with a lot of different groups of people across the company. And, and I was, I tried to be authentic. And I think people have this bullshitometer, built-in bullshitometer, when they can just spot the lack of authenticity. They don't even know what it is, but they sense it right away. And I was always trying to be myself and authentic and not trying to be someone I wasn't. And I think that was one of the reasons that we were able to turn 2,000 employees into owner-managers that wanted to succeed and some people call it culture. I call it cult. We wanted to win. You know, failure was never an option and people went hard and we treated them exceptionally well. And it was a win-win. To create a symmetry of risk, did you have to, or did you feel it important to put your own money into the company when you were growing it and were the captain of the ship? Jeez, it's like you, you know, my pet peeves. Um, <laughs> ab absolutely. Absolutely. Like I had at one point half my net worth and in Pemina. So did my former boss, Bob Michaleski. He had a ton. Of, and then at one point we had his former boss, Lauren Gordon, who was the chairman of the board and, and he had a ton of money. So I think what you find is companies with great boards usually are big investors. And I think that's a, a huge thing when you have disinterested board members at times who don't have any skin in the game. I think that's a real, if I'm going to make material investment in, in a company, that's one of the first things I look at. And you'll note that when I joined secure, I was immediately at the required investment level because I just, if I'm not going to put a material investment into a company, I'm not going to join their board because I'm not interested enough. Where'd you learn that? Was it kind of intuitive or did somebody teach you that? Because not everybody understands that side of business, it seems. <laughs> well, I love ambitious owner-manager companies. And I just read an article in the Wall Street Journal, I think Bain, Bain wrote it, how companies with owner-managers and companies who have generations of CEOs on the board and, and that they tend to outperform. I think it's just human nature. If you've got a big stake in something, you pay attention to it and you, you, you live the ups and downs and you sweat it. That leads to great performance. It's, it's, it's really about alignment, isn't it? In the old days, the engineer used to stand under the bridge is one metaphor that uh, really made sense to me. So. Yeah. My dad's <laughs> a, a PhD in bridge design, so I can relate. Um, do you remember the day you realized Pemina was a, major business in Canada. And it may have been pretty large to start, but do you remember the day it became massive? I think probably when we acquired Provident, we were buying gas plants and, and vertically integrating. But when we, I think that acquisition at the time represented about 40% of combined enterprise value. And we started to aspire to, there was a big two, it was Enbridge and Trap. 
and and our our mission was to gain enough respect and respect wasn't measured in size like we wanted to be the the leading infrastructure company and and size is one aspect of that but best safety record most profitable uh we wanted to be mentioned and i think pambana is now today is is mentioned as the big 3 and so i think that started around the time we acquired provident that we wanted to be one of the big 3 and certainly it was solidified when we bought verison we we gone from the big two and, and a smattering of sub bit ten billion dollar companies to we were thirty billion at the time and we realized that we we were coming towards accomplishing that goal. So of course we set new goals. It's one thing to grow, to issue a bunch of shares and blow out the shareholders and buy everything in sight and makes you feel good, I guess, as a leader, but it's a whole nother thing to do it correctly and manage the capital correctly. Were you always aware of that aspect of the business to treat the shareholders right? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, and you're obviously well-versed in this growth for growth sake. I mean, when we see it still, you know, companies are growing, but, but I'm a, you know, and my team and our culture and our board were per share people. What is cash flow per share? You know, what's cash flow per share going to be? And during that time we grew from, two to 40, I think we quadrupled our cash flow per share at the same time. And, and that's pretty special in infrastructure because it's a game of pennies. But at the same time, we really greatly reduced the risk of that cash flow through diversifying across commodities. When Pamela was younger, it was all oil exposure pretty much. And, you know, we ended up in having an equal amount of oil, gas and NGL exposure. We got into uh, more refined products. And so the diversity and the, the riskiness of our cash flow uh, just improved that cash flow quality and, and our multiple went up as well, right? So it was one thing to quadruple your cash flow per share, but but when it it actually you had multiple expansion on top of that because of the quality of it, I think that was very rewarding for us. And that was very carefully planned. Now it is the infrastructure, the physical assets are, are valuable on one end because it's really hard to build new ones. But on the other hand, it makes it difficult to grow organically in some sense. How do you grow organically in a midstream business nowadays when you can't get anything done? Is it Are you looking west to LNG? Are you trying to buy out your neighbors? Or what do you see as the, how do you grow? Well, you know, as in terms of Pamina, that might be a better question for Scott Burroughs, the, the, you know, good friend of mine. Maybe in general. In, in current CEO. I, I honestly, I think, uh, I think infrastructure is going to be tough for a little while. Exactly. The producers, you know, they have sponsored massive development. If you, if you kind of go across the different parts of the sector, we have, Abund, you know, when Trans Mountain comes on, we're going to have abundant oil egress. We're going to have roughly 600,000 barrels a day of egress that we have no oil for, prepaid by producers. And we've got plenty of gas egress. I mean, we, we used to export what 10, 11 bees a day out of Empress. And now that's, you know, four or five. Uh, oil sands pipes are all half full. You've got, uh, caps coming in, a looping Pembina. There's still areas of the basin that are that are tighter, but these are all projects for the most part that have been sponsored by their producer community, and now they have spare capacity to use up, and so they've they've paid for it. Now they're going to use it, and so I think I think growth is tough. Uh, organic growth. I mean, Pema had a, a tremendous run of organic growth when volumes were building on the heels of shale. We recognized that that would happen, and we we were able to front run it. I think that's, you know, maybe one, one of the difference of opinion I had, uh, with when I was still at Pamina with the board was around growth. Mm -hmm. And I, I had been a builder of organic, but also a, a buyer. And I, I was more in favor of continuing that growth, even in the, in the face of, you know, the pandemic and, and the, the oil downturn. I, I kind of was pretty bullish on, on hydrocarbons and on, on the basin in particular. And, you know, there's a lot of good companies, uh, that weren't, you know, Shell and BP, for example, they weren't very optimistic on hydrocarbons and now they've done an about face and 
we both saw Exxon and, and Chevron do major acquisitions. I think we were talking earlier about investing in the business. They don't think that business is only going to last 15 years. They've always been optimistic and I remain optimistic about the hydrocarbon business, but I would say with rising interest rates and, and somewhat overbuilding the, the avenue for North American infrastructure is more M&A than, than organic right now. There's things to do. Don't get me wrong. But, um, I would say, um, organic is going to be tougher. Maybe to get it right from the source, what makes a good midstream company to you? Is it straight throughput, the highest volume wins? Is it kind of a balance of assets across the country? It's, it's, it's scarcity. You have an offering that no one else has and you build franchises that no one else has. Not that you, you know, you, you use your franchise to gouge because there's, there's lots of, you know, regulation and things like that that prohibit that. But you are able to maintain your market share and cost savings belong to you. And so it's about building unique franchises. For example, Pemina has a tremendous fractionation franchise. Up until CAPS, they had a tremendous uh, liquids oil gathering franchise in Peace. Alliance Pipeline is a tremendous, unique natural gas export franchise. TransCanada has an amazing gas gathering franchise. Enbridge has an amazing oil export franchise. It'll be somewhat impaired with Trans Mountain. But those are the things that build lasting midstream companies is to be able to defend market share, capture cost savings and continue to grow volume. One of the uh, critiques or fears, I guess, that I've heard sometimes from Bay Street is that they love the valuable nature of the assets from the Canadian midstreamers, but they're scared of the capital intensity of the business. And the fact, you got to issue shares sometimes and uh, it really just erodes the quality of the business when you compare it to a capital light business like, say, Google or something like that? What, what would you say to somebody with that perspective? How do you outline the positive attributes of the business? In, listen, the whole oil and gas business, I mean, barring minor uh, niches is capital intensive now. I mean, even in the upstream side, if you're you're playing a shale, you know, drilling a pad with 10 wells and, you know, outfitting, that's $100 million. I mean, you used to be able to start a nice oil and gas company for a hundred million dollars. And now it's a, a set of well pads. And then by the time you add your, your gas plant, you really can't do anything in the shale for under $250 million. Infra, infra is no different. It's the economies of scale you need to be competitive. Yes. In, in certain tech startup scenarios, you know, your cost of sales is only the intellectual capital, but th- those are pretty when they get to scale, they're pretty capital intensive businesses uh, as well. They don't necessarily have the, the franchise protection. I mean, some do through technology and staying, staying ahead, but real assets, real cash flow. Uh, I think there's, there's a, a place for that. That seems to be people can discontinue their Netflix subscription if they want to, but they can't, they're, they're not too wise to discontinue their natural gas subscription. So there's, there is a different difference there, um, with, I think, resilience in, in certain times. But obviously tech's an amazing sector and, and really is backstopped. I think the, the enrichment of North America, like no other business in a hundred years. It seems like the tide may be turning a little bit back towards the real assets and the realization that. Hydrocarbons are needed and that it's not going away. Have you seen a change in that maybe in the last year or two since the pandemic? Absolutely. I mean, you listen, in the, in the middle of the pandemic, everything was sliding so hard towards energy transition that you, you almost couldn't write an article about imperial oil does good. Tourmaline does good because no one even wanted to hear it. I mean, there's so many good things being done. And now, you know, people are starting to get courage. Like yesterday, uh, the CEO of Chevron said, we're proud of what we do. We're not ashamed of what we do. You almost couldn't even say that, you know, you're heating people's homes and think about the quality of life differences that the hydrocarbon business has made for the globe. 
And there, there was a time when, you know, we had to wear t-shirts that said, I love oil and gas when we're providing today's a snowy, cold day. And thank God for natural gas. That's all I can say. And it's okay to be proud of that. And uh, I think more people are becoming proud of that. And, and it, the media is letting people back in a little bit to tell their story. Not, not a lot yet, but it's, I think, I think we've, we've tested the edges of the rhetoric against the oil and gas sector. As a result, the valuations of a lot of the EMP companies and energy and maybe the midstream a little bit too have been compressed due to you, whatever reason you want to state. What do you think changes that? Is it demonstrating consistent returns? Is it change in sentiment? Or what will it take to value the energy companies higher? Uh, just some time. I think we're a multiple to two multiples shy of where, where they should be trading, but it's going to take time. The generals have to come, come back in. And the way that happens is that some funds have good returns that invested in energy and some that didn't invest in energy didn't have good returns and they've just got to come back. And I don't go to as many conferences as I used to, but I'm seeing that, you know, the ones I do go to, I'm seeing generalist investors return and they'll start out cautious with the blue chips. And I do think that we're going to find a harmony be between how fast renewable energy can take over market share. I think it's, it, it's a trend and it's going to keep increasing, but we also got to remember demand, global demand is increasing too. So I just don't see a scenario where hydrocarbon demand is flat. Like I think it's going to grow and maybe more of that growth comes from renewables, particularly with the subsidies we're seeing, but I, I just don't see a scenario where the EIA is right. I, I think the other forecasts are right that we're going to have, we're not at peak demand and we're not going to be there anytime soon. It's just, I just don't see it. Not taking it personally. A lot of uh, tourists come back into the sector now or quote unquote Airbnb -ers. when you're leading a company and those tourists leave the sector do you ever find it hard not to take it personally and when they do come back and start calling? How do you deal with that? Is it, is it just business? I mean, it hurts when your top investor, you find out your top investor sold. Like it, it, it hurts. And I always did take it personally. I mean, I, my person and, and Pamina were so highly overlapped that I could lie to you and say I didn't take it personally. But when I lost a major shareholder, I did. But I, I, you know, it is what it is. It's business. And, I just made it a, tried to make it a, a point to win them over again, stay in touch, be friendly and try to get them back invested and, and uh, play the long game. Berkshire would be an example of they seek a certain type of shareholder where they're perfectly happy if a lot of the world is not investing them because they don't want the turnover in the shares. Did you ever view it like that at Pemino or you just, you preferred certain shareholders just to keep the volume down or is that possible to public company or how do you think of it that way? You don't really control it, but I think you, you do want to focus on fewer large shareholders to a point. I mean, you're never going to get away from, you know, half retail and hedge funds bobbing in and out, but to have your, I think we used to, to grade ourselves, Burroughs and I and Cam on, on how many of our top shareholders we could keep from one year to the next. And, um, having those sticky shareholders, because let's remember, like, what, what's the float on a, uh, any given day? 1%. If you get a 6% shareholder who's not sticky and they churn out of the position, your stock's going to go down a lot. So we, we, we prided ourselves on having sticky shareholders for sure. And, you know, the other beauty of having a relationship, a long-term relationship with large capital providers is they see a lot more than we do. We, we see, you know, what's happening around Pemina, but these guys see what's happening around the globe and they have a broader lens or we're one of 50, hundred investments and they, they see money flows. And, and I would say when we were meeting with investors for the most part, it wasn't, it was a, it was a discussion. It wasn't an interview. And, uh, there was a, we tried to ask them as many questions as they, they asked us. We, we thought it was for our mutual benefit. Interest rates are going up. Hypothetically, if you were in the driver's seat now, you had debt on the balance sheet. That makes it more expensive as a midstream company. What is the solution in an environment like this? Do you 
you want to grow, but at the same time, it's you don't want to issue tons of equity. You don't want to take on lots of debts. You've been really good at this sort of thing. What would you do? I chase the best return if I think my stock's undervalued. I mean, we never did any of this with stock buybacks at Pemina because we always had better uses of capital. But in any business, you know, I'm involved with, whether it's Secure or Pemina or an upstream company, it's about capital allocation. So if you, you know, let's say you're an upstream company and you can drill wells that have half cycle returns of 200% and and you think your your stocks, you know, you're trading at four and a half times and you're undervalued by, we will call it four times to make the math easy. And you should be trading at five. That's, that's a 20% return if you, if you're right and you buy back your stock. But why would you do that when you can drill wells that on a full cycle basis give you 100% IRR? So uh, it's just math. You try not to, to get, um, too, too emotional about it. It's math and risk. If you do an acquisition, will it reduce your risk and improve the quality of your cash flow? So it's it's what is the return of that acquisition and, and how does it de-risk your cash flow? And another word for de-risking is multiple expansion. If it de-risks it, the market will figure out that your cash flow is worth more. So those things against stock buybacks versus, you know, greenfields. Good management teams and good boards should always have that in, in front of them. And I'm not saying they should jump into it. But they need to know where to put their money. And when I was involved with Pemina, it was always brownfield first because that was always, if you could expand an existing plant you'd already paid for, that was first. Greenfield was second. Uh, Greenfield had more risk and acquisition was third. And distance fourth back then was stock buybacks. The problem is that the markets or the public perception when you do a deal or something like that may not uh, agree because they don't understand it. When you're running a public company, I guess you just think long term. It's called leadership. Doing what you and your team think is right for the shareholders over a long period of time and all stakeholders and not letting the market dictate your business plan. And Is that hard? <laughs> um, it wasn't for me. But I think it's very hard for a lot of boards that go counter cyclical and they, they try to guess what the market wants and play into that, pander to the market and they finish last. I think you have to have a strategy. You have to execute the strategy. And sometimes the strategy will come into conflict with current market trends. And there's always going to be some analysts or some investor that says, Oh, you, you know, I've seen it all. You have too much debt. You don't have enough debt. You're not using the balance sheet. You have a strategy. You follow the strategy. I remember something, this goes way back. I can't remember, like probably 25 years. I remember Rick George, he did did a deal and he got challenged. It was an oil sands deal and he got challenged about oil sands. And he said, we're an oil sands company. If you want to invest in an oil sands company, invest here. If you don't, don't invest here. And obviously that stuck with me and that's how I, I mean, the team ran Pemina was we had conviction and we had support of the boards that we were going to do it this way. And we did that way. And we bought Provident. We did a lot of our biggest deal on the heels of, we bought Cut Bank on the heels of financial crisis. You know, we, we did a lot of our big deals in a countercyclical way. We weren't being opportunistic. It was just the plan. And we stuck to the plan. That was my true north, right? Like having a strategy, sticking to the strategy. We were very successful. Kind of like Murray Edwards buying Royal Sands in 1999? Ab- absolutely. Or, or Mike Rose buying Black Swan for, it would be worth 15 times as much now. Do you, th- you think it was easy for Mike? You know, you, you think, oh, yeah, they, they did this, they did that, you know, and oh, yeah, it was obvious, or Adam Watcher's doing what he's done. Those are gut-wrenching decisions for those guys. And do you think that in the depths of the pandemic, Mike Rose's shareholders were going, hey, Mike, out a boy, you know, way to be counter-cyclical. They were like probably the opposite, but he had a plan. He stuck to the plan. His board supported him, and he marched on, and all, all these these – Tremendous success stories stuck to the plan. Is it hard to sleep on those nights sometimes? <laughs> Absolutely. You know, you know it is. It's 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 really tough. And 
bracing yourself for told you sowers. Oh, you shouldn't have done that. Interest rates were too high or this or that, or you could have foreseen commodity prices would change or whatever, right? Like that's capitalism though, right? Capitalism is to have a team, to have a point of view, to take reasonable risks and bet right. That's what capitalism is. And I think there's many companies that have forgotten that capital allocation and risk allocation, if you are never take a risk, then you just are what you are and you uh, bump along until someone buys you. I mean, we've seen that movie many times, haven't we? Did you view it as a puzzle almost, a psychology puzzle? Were you aware of it or was it just kind of implicit? Going against the grain, having to deal, not be on sleep at night. <laughs> you know, I think it's a it's a hundred data points, mostly influenced by your smart coworkers, your key keyboard people. While we're on boards, I I think it's it's critical. My new number: if you have a ten person board, at least five need to be sector experts. And when when I see boards with no sector experts flying in from a foreign country, I didn't realize how devastating that can be to, to shareholder value. So having a, a highly skilled, experienced board and, and trustworthy and trustworthy and, and open lines of communication and a, and a great team, you form your view and it takes, it takes courage. But uh, to me, you don't do what Pamina does or what CNRL has done or to Spur has done or, or Tourmaline or any of these tremendous success stories without a view. And you get that view. Like I say, I'm a solid B student, but I try to surround myself with solid, solid Bs or A's and a form of view through a, a thousand conversations. And so you can't really put your finger, I can't really put my finger onto one thing that we did better than everyone else, but I would say we made very few mistakes. I would say the with Burroughs and I, the Batman and Robin combo, I can take some credit for instigating and being ambitious and getting a lot of things on the table. And he can take a lot of credit for making sure we never made any mistakes. I'm talking about Scott, but but we had a great team. You know, we had multidisciplinary team of dedicated people and board members that just helped guide us collectively the right direction. I think it takes a it takes a family, you know. Levi Strauss serviced the gold rush in San Francisco in the late 1800s. Did you view Pemina in that way or secure any of the service side businesses that you're there to supply, so to speak? And oftentimes there's a lot of opportunity in that sense. You know, opportunity comes and goes, I guess. I uh, certainly when, when I, you know, when I joined secure, I had, I had a view that they they can run from a service perspective. Yeah, they can run from a, a service perspective. I think they're just getting started in terms of the market really understanding what they are and the quality of their cash flow. And so I think it's going to going to run. They've got a great team, they've got a great board. I'm delighted to be there. I felt the same way. You know, when I joined Pemina, other, other boards, uh, I think what you can assume is if and when I join other boards that I will have a view that they'll, they they can run. Servicing the gold rush. They're going to be successful and I'm going to put a lot of my, my money into it. And I don't know if I'll be right, but so far, so good. We can't all work as hard as maybe my Tim's. Yeah. But you had to work really hard to be the CEO of a multi-billion dollar energy company or midstream company. How important do you think hard work is? It's more important than people think. I see the merits of workplace flexibility. I believe in it to a, to a point, but I, I just don't think that companies that don't work 40 hours a week largely together will be able, com- able to compete with companies that do. And the, the ones that aren't working a, a bunch of hours with their core staff in on core hours will just not be as creative. Uh, I've got a simple analogy is – if it was effective to work remotely, why wouldn't it be effective to do social activities remotely? 
try having a campfire, sitting around the campfire and having a beer and having a great time remotely. There's no magic, right? Like it's just, it's not even fun. You, you would never even think about it. But that, that same magic is required in the workplace to get people brainstorming. Oh, I did, that didn't occur to me uh, running into someone in the plus 15. So I think that shareholders are, are going to rightfully demand that people work full time again, you know, and I, I see the trend reversing. I think, you know, what, what underlied it and I, listen, I was in the chair. We were just so happy when the pandemic happened that we could work remotely that, you know, that we could keep oil flowing through the pipes and people could be safe that there was just such an elation that we could still make money that, that the, again, the pendulum swung too far there. And we were happy to be just reactive. Staying at home is a reactive thing. It's not a proactive thing. You, you do what you're asked to do. But if you're done your, your work and after hour five in the day, you're not walking around the office talking to people, figuring out what you're going to do for the last three hours. You're off to other things and, and depends on your job. Maybe that's okay. But in most jobs, walking around the office, figuring out what you're going to do next and talking to people creates a spark. To get into the weeds a little bit, what does that mean for in terms of hard work? You were up at four or five, worked till eight or nine for 20 years straight? <laughs> no, no. I, I would just say that I loved what I did. I, I loved what I did too much, actually, that, that I, after having kind of a retirement year, I realized I, I maybe went too far, you know, and I, I gave up too many other things and there was too much of a vortex in my life, not having work and trying to this last number of months, call it eight months. I've kind of recalibrated with a, maybe a little better balance in mind, but it wasn't about the hours for me. It was that when I was washing my hair, I was thinking about how to solve a problem or who to hire or what deal to do or what cost to save or how to get a board member on board was something. I just lived it. I loved it. And so I wouldn't define my commitment in hours because I wasn't, I wasn't at work at seven, like my buddy Stu Taylor, who's still, I, every time I come in, I'm still in the same building. I see their cars and their early, early guys. That's not how I would measure my commitment. My commitment was I would toil on big problems relentlessly until they were solved uh, every hour, even when I was dreaming, sometimes I was solving problems and it's because I loved what I did and I wanted everyone to be successful. When you're running a big company to prevent the expert PowerPoint givers or the expert meeting attendees how do you prevent the, those types from rising? Can you see them from afar? Is it easy to spot so that you're not creating a bureaucracy with those types? It's absolutely easy. I talked about employees having a bullshitometer about leaders. You know, um, you know, when you were a student, you you knew whether the prof or the teacher was the real deal. You you didn't think about authenticity or stuff. You just decided whether you're going to listen to them or not. Um, and that's how employees are with leaders, but leaders are that way too with employees. You, you can see it a mile away. The posers, I call them, right? The virtue signalers mm -hmm. and people who are trying to look good, but you know, the work wasn't done. The substance wasn't there. They try to bullshit you uh, on a line of questioning instead of just saying, you know, that's a good question. Does anyone here in the room know the answer to that? Cause I don't. And I wish I would, would have figured that out, but I didn't. And uh, that's fine. That's a fine answer. But yeah, it's pretty, pretty transparent for, for sophisticated managers to, to figure out who, who's adding value. Nassim hmm. Talib would say, you want your heart surgeon to look like a butcher. If you don't look the part, it's a lot harder to get there. Maybe there's some element to that when you're hiring employees or trying to build an organization, people that had to work a little harder to get to the spot, or there's some, like you said, way to detect the falseness. Yeah, I don't, I, like, I took a lot of heat from HR. Um, over the years about, uh, I am completely merit-based. If you got it and you only have three years experience, you got it. Like I remember having a, a, a new VP and, you know, he was, he didn't really get into, to, to business until a bit later in life, but he just had it. 
And, you know, he went from entry level to supervisor to manager to senior manager to VP in like five years. And HR is like, you can't do this. Like you're, you're killing all the other guys who are working hard. And I was just like, you know what? 10% of your people, there's a lot of people that do a lot of good stuff, but it's actually 10% of the people that actually move your company to a new place. And I just, the times I didn't move some of those people fast enough, I regretted it. It was just merit-based and it did piss people off at times. And I apologize to those people that I pissed off. Um, a lot of us can only move at a certain speed and some people can just move quicker. And I just didn't want those people to slip through our fingers. Some people would call it time in industry versus what you actually provide. They'll tell you they've been in the industry for 30 years, but they haven't really done anything. Yeah. They've had done the same job for, you know, they've learned one year experience 30 times over. That's fair. You ever think of starting a new midstream company, buying a pipeline, maybe a gas asset? I'm more focused in upstream right now. I've I got a lot of inbounds. Uh, I, I think I could raise a significant amount of money for midstream. Mm -hmm. But I think the value proposition is just more favorable in, in upstream right now than midstream. I love midstream. I think I'll find myself on a midstream board before too long because I love it. And I think I have value to add. But as I think about, you know, my next chapter, my next decade, I think it'll be a smaller, more agile family office type company and it'll be in, it'll be in upstream because it just, I love, love the capital intensity of upstream. I love the, the multi multidisciplinary skill set required. And, and I think importantly, that's, I've done midstream for a long time. I don't want to sound boastful, but I know that business very well and I'm still learning upstream and that's a strike against on one hand, but learning's a spice of life. And so I'm, I'm pretty, pretty psyched on moving in that direction right now. Not getting bored. Not getting bored. No, just keep learning to keep trying to create stuff. Be, be up to something. You're relatively young too, to be retired. Yeah. I like, uh, some days I feel all 60, but most, most of the time I feel like the busier I am within reason the happier I am. I, I don't, I, I miss so much about running Pemina, but there's lots of stuff I don't miss. So I'm trying to find, keep most of the things that I loved and not, uh, eject some of the things I didn't. Good advice and bad advice. Sometimes they come from the same person, two sides of the same coin. What's the best advice and worst advice you've ever got? I think I had the privilege of at, at a young age, interfacing with a really serious executive search guy. His name was Michael Honey. He told me early on, don't chase the money, chase the experience. So if you can get a job within your own company that you couldn't get in the paper, take it. So I, I did that. I took lots of different jobs. I think the highest profile uh, example of that was when I was business development at Pem and I, I stepped into the COO role. I heard your podcast with, with Ian Dundas, how he became COO for a while. And I think he would reflect on that as I do as a golden opportunity. Like when does a lawyer get to be COO? When does an accountant get to be a COO? Again, you surround yourself with good people. You, you're a sponge, you're learning and you realize it's a lot, most of it's common sense. Yes, you need technical expertise. So, so broadening experience, especially early in your career, I think is, is the way to go. And, you know, we, we all like to have a little nicer house or a little nicer car. And so money's important, but you got to play the long game with, with experience for sure. I think that was really good advice. Other good advice was not to, ring fence yourself just because you don't have the right degree for, you know, the COO example is kind of along those lines. So don't sell yourself short where you can learn new things. So I think that was, that was really good advice. Oh, bad advice. What, what comes to mind when you say that is uh, I've, I've seen it in, you know, when dot com came, I saw it when marijuana came, how th things that don't make financial sense will fall apart eventually. They always have to make financial sense. And I saw that with renewables. 
in 2020, people were building wind farms for 4% before tax or 6% before tax and leveraging them 80%. And I'm just like, this isn't going to end well. Things that don't make sense, they just don't make sense. And, and no amount of, we can all thank Warren Buffett for that. He always sucked, stuck to that, stuck to, it doesn't make sense to me, so I'm not doing it. Are you a Buffett fan? Yeah, I'm a Buffett fan. Yeah, I've gotten to know Greg Abel, who's going to take over from from Buffett, and he's a hell of a guy, Edmonton guy, and and, and treasure that uh, relationship. And they're just solid, disciplined, old fashioned. Nothing but admiration for those guys. They're going to be around a long time. Also makes me wonder why you can't be over seventy two year old old on a board when Buffett's. What is he? How old is he? 90 something. Okay. Let me understand that you're, you're too dumb when you're 72 to sit on a public board, but the world's most successful investors, 92 and him and his whatever Munger is, he's not a dumb guy either. 99. 99. And, and they fill a, an auditorium full of people who are hanging on every word, but you can't be on a board when you're 72. Maybe you just can't be on a board when you're not qualified to be on a board and mm-hmm. the age is kind of nonsense. At times, you luck plays a part in everyone's career. Randomness, chaos. Yeah, for sure. Do you look back at times where luck maybe you played a factor? And have you always been aware of the role of luck in life? Yeah, I I think about that a lot. I mean, my my introduction to midstream being in an E and P company as at Hess at the time, and a friend of mine was starting the Nova Gas Canada, a subsidiary of. Nova, which was going to be a midstream company. I got that job based on a personal relationship and it was luck that I ended up in midstream. Didn't even know what midstream was. Right. And it just made a lot of sense to me. And so that, that was luck. I think good luck happens to busy people. Knowing when to capitalize. Yeah. And, and just, you, you can't get lucky if you're not doing anything, you know, and one of the, one of my boss's bosses at Nova, Kent Jesperson, he oversaw among other things, the, the Nova gas company that I worked for. And he always said, you show me somebody who's not doing anything and I'll show you someone who's never going to get lucky. I mean, is, is luck, is luck looking at a whole bunch of things and choosing the right one to do? Mm-hmm. You don't get that scenario if you're not looking at a whole bunch of things. Right. On the flip side, do you remember times where you had to just sit, the art of waiting and- um, Oh, I'm living it, man. Being patient. <laughs> I'm living it. I mean- <laughs> It's hard. It, it's, it's it, you know, right now for me, trying to find the, the next platform every month is like a year long. It's it's really challenging. But again, you know, back to the, the Pemina example, I think one of the things, you know, we had we had some- little stumbles, but we, we never really made any bad capital allocation decisions. We tried to do petrochemicals and we, we didn't end up getting it done, but I didn't want to build a $5 billion gas plant in the middle of a pandemic. I wanted to do that. I couldn't do it. Some would say the Jordan Cove opportunity, you know, the LNG opportunity in Oregon was too ambitious. We invested 300 million that we ended up writing off, but we made that back on the break fee on Interpipe. So you, know, you call those a wash. There's your good luck and your, and your bad luck, but at least we were doing something and the company learned a lot. And now they've got Cedar LNG, which would have never happened had we gone down that road with Jordan Cove. Well, I could ask you questions all day, basically at an hour, maybe a couple more. Um, yeah, sure. Go ahead. You can <laughs> high grade then. Charlie Munger's comments on leadership would be that preferably it's a man, or I guess you could say a woman over the age of 80, sitting in a room alone, thinking about corporate strategy. Have you ever thought about that from your perspective and your role along the lines of you can perform perhaps even better as the, as the years go on? In some ways, I mean, you, you've got to be like, I, I realize now, like I can't crush spreadsheets like I used to, you know, sit up till two in the morning, mm-hmm. crushing spreadsheets and my capacity to do high quality work quickly. It's, it's on a one way street, but my ability to judge and pull in different experiences and, and most of all people, the higher level strategic thinking, I think is, I think you can do for a long time. You just can't crush work anymore. So it's a diversity thing. You need lots of different skills and age groups and backgrounds to 
have a great team and I uh, can contribute, I think, in a, in a meaningful way, but just differently than when I was 40 or 30. Lots of people are busy at work, but it's easy to be busy at times. How did you determine or how did you work on things that were important? Did you, did it take a while to realize that or are you still working on it? How, how do you think about that? Especially as CEO. Well, I think the CEO's job is to, is to frame the company's work product in a way that benefits the stakeholders. So you're not just busy. Yeah. And, and to, to stamp out stuff that isn't, it could be interesting, but it's not in alignment with what the company's trying to do. And, you know, it, it was always heartbreaking for me when someone would bring me a work product that was a high quality work product, but it, it was not in service of what the company was doing. And I would say, this is great, but you've wasted your time because this isn't in strategy for us. And, and so to, to get that, to ask yourself that every day and ask that of your management team and have that go right to the frontline worker who understands the owner manager mindset and also to attract employees whose personal objectives, like imagine this circle here is your personal objective and this is the company objective. When those don't overlap, this is just work. When they start to overlap, those circles start to overlap. Half is good, two thirds, three quarters. When somebody's personal objectives are being fulfilled while doing their job at the court, when those overlap, that's magic. That's, that's culture at its finest. And so some people just can't get there. You know, they want to work on stuff that isn't in the company's interest and they can be entirely successful when they find out where their personal interests overlap the companies. And that's why working at Pemina wasn't for everybody. Hmm. Problem is some people get rewarded for busy work and they do, but that's a management problem. It, it really is. And I would say when Pemina was peaking, we had a bunch of fantastic years, people's personal objectives overlapped the company's objectives and they were excited. You know, our engagement scores were through the roof. It was, it was super fun. Do you ever look at the graveyard, the ones that didn't make it? Do you, do you look where everyone studies success, but some people would say you don't learn as much from success. You have to look at the ones that didn't make it. Do you ever look there? Yeah, a lot. There's not, the town's not riddled with failed midstream companies, you know, I mean, it's, but there's the, the town is riddled with failed E&P companies. And it's back to what I, I said earlier, when you were building a dot com business that had, was trading at a hundred times revenue and had negative cash flow, and there's no way to get past that. Or a marijuana company that whose value was based on how many square feet of warehouse space they would have to grow marijuana and, and they'd be losing money or an E&P company 10 years ago that was getting paid to grow production regardless of, of free cash flow. That's, that's where the skeletons are buried. It's about cash flow per share and predictable cash flow per share. And, and there can be exceptions. Some of the greatest stories I would say, you know, what Elon Musk has done and, and others who didn't necessarily have free cash flow right away, but they had such a powerful vision. But those are so damn rare. It's got to generate good free cash flow per share. And all the skeletons are buried with the companies who never achieved that or forgot that they needed to achieve that and, and started to take their company in a way that didn't honor profitability. Hmm. Well... Um, that is basically an hour. I know you're busy. So to wrap things up, if you were to give advice, uh, the lessons you've learned, maybe what you would recommend or suggest to somebody to lead a good organization, what might you say? Well, I think the number one thing is, is authenticity. It takes too much energy to act. So be authentic, lead authentically, tell the truth, even when it's, when it's hard. And to, to people, younger people coming into the workforce or is, as I said, find a company 
whose values and what they're trying to do reflects your own, then you'll, you'll really never work a day in your life because you're, you're doing what you do for fun anyway. For me now, looking back, I, I've been extremely lucky because I've most of the time I've been doing what I find fun and that's where I'm hopefully headed in the future again. Oh, also favorite memory at the Haskin School of Business. <laughs> Haskin University for me was like a job. I was being entrepreneurial and had part-time jobs and all that. So I, I wasn't really, I think the, the, the fondest memory or it's just the study group I had. I had some great people in a study group and we had a lot of laughs and stuff, but I, I didn't ever center my, my life around university. That's uh, good news for all the, uh, maybe not the straight A students that you can lead a billion dollar company one day. Well, you know, it's funny because uh, I have done some lectures at, uh, at Haskane. I've done some lectures in the law school there as well. My sister is a professor or was teaching trust in the States there, but at, at Haskane, you know what they have me do is they actually have me come in and talk to the struggling students to say, Hey, you know, I, I had a semester with a D average okay. at one point in my, my career. And, it doesn't mean you're an idiot. It just means you're not interested in what you're doing and just kind of contextualize the whole thing and maybe encourage people to switch faculties or uh, do what they need to do to, you know, that, that's really because you, you meet with these young people and you know, they're smart. They're just not interested in what they're doing and, and just to provide that perspective. So I really enjoyed that. And I kept actually a lot of the nice cards I'd gotten over uh, the time I'd done that of how I've helped people and really enjoyed that. I think that's a great place to leave the formal conversation. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Enjoyed I, it. No, the listeners will really appreciate it. So I hope so. And uh, I enjoy listening to your podcasts and I've started uh, going through a bunch of them, but uh, there's so many that have caught my eye that I'm going to, that's what I'm going to be listening to on the drive out to the cabin from now on. Well, you'll get sick of my voice. But, uh. <laughs> I don't think so. You're very good at what you do. I appreciate it. Thanks for listening, everyone. Hopefully you enjoyed the episode. If you liked what you heard, check out rosebros.ca where we will have upcoming shows. Until next time, Happy coffee drinking.